Welcome, and I hope everybody can hear me. Um, this is Making a Life, the conversation number three with Nikki McClure. And uh, before we get started, I just wanna ask you all to work hard to stay muted. Um, it just makes everything go much more smoothly. We think we have the settings right so that you can't accidentally unmute yourself, but if you do, um, then one of us, one of our behind the scenes people will try to jump in and, uh, and, and uh, mute you, or you can, if you catch it, you can do it yourself. Um, I think it is exactly one o'clock, so it's time to get started. Um, uh, if you please in the chat, if you could tell us where you're from, and if you desire, please also tell us something you love to do with your hands. Um, so a common way to introduce someone is to tell you what their profession is. But I, um, I wrote a, um, a bio for Nikki McClure today that doesn't start with her profession. She hasn't heard it, so I hope that she's comfortable with it. But uh, here goes. Uh, Nikki McClure is a human mother, wife, daughter, sister, friend who loves to live in community and harmony with the natural world of which we are all part. She loves to make friends, meals, discoveries, pictures, and books. So Nikki is our guest of honor today. And before we start talking to Nikki though, we're actually gonna talk very quickly to one of her good friends, Pat Castaldo, who is the um, co-founder of BioLympia, which is our book selling partner for the event. And so, and you'll see um, when Pat comes on, he's actually, he's identified as underscore ask a question. And Pat, I would like, I know you and Nikki have been friends since the 1980s when you met in, in Olympia. And could you just tell us what, um, what by Olympia is about, what inspired you to found it and the role that Nikki plays in it? Sure, um, we, so back in, hi everyone. I'm Pat. Um, back in the early 90s, late 80s, I was part of a community along with Nikki of um, punk rock people, basically people making music or being interested in the music scene in Olympia, Washington. And so as some of us who are not great musicians, um, we started making other things besides music, art, crafts. Um, and so one of the things we did to start by Olympia was all these people were making stuff who weren't involved in the music scene or were involved tangentially. And what they wanted to do was also share their art. There was already an existing system for music. I mean, there were record labels and people were touring, but there wasn't the same thing for art. So it wasn't easy for people to share and get that. And so in 1998, my partner and I started working on a website that's now called by Olympia. Um, we launched it in 1999, and the first product we ever had was Nikki McClure's Year 2000 calendar. Um, I had been working with Nikki on art and things, as well as inside the punk community, going to shows, and I think that's probably where we first met, um, was at shows at the backstage of the Capitol Theater in downtown Olympia. And so we started by Olympia in 99 to help sell our friends art, and here we are 21 years later, still doing that. Thanks. Thanks very much, Pat. Um, so Nikki, it's time for our conversation to start. I hope you are comfortable with my bio of you. Um, 
I'm dividing this conversation into four parts. We have a lot to cover and I'm hoping that we'll be able to do that and still stay on time. And the first part is just really setting the scene about your upbringing and arriving in Olympia. I know that you played artist as a child, but you never, and growing up in Kirkland, Washington, and you never imagined that you could actually be an artist. Um, that seemed fantastical to you. Then you went to Olympia, went to Evergreen College, a place where you get to design your own major. Um, and in addition to studying uh, there in science and, um, well, you can tell us about that, you also got involved in the music scene. So I would like you to talk to us a little bit about getting to Olympia and why it was such a hotbed of kind of DIY music and ultimately a place where the DIY Renaissance seems to have really taken off ahead of a lot of other parts of the country. Okay. Um well, first off, let's go back to kind of childhood. And I was the kid who like always sat and watched things or um, if there was a lot of plums in the tree, I would pick them all and sit on this corner and try to sell every last plum with a bathroom scale as my way of measuring. And then um, about eighth grade, I heard about Evergreen State College where you could go and you could really study whatever you wanted. and. And they had no grades and there was a lot of room for experimentation and exploration and they also taught you how to sail if you wanted. So in eighth grade I decided I was going to go to Evergreen. Then about I guess I was a junior in high school my mom moved to San Juan Island and I refused to go. I wanted to continue with my <laughs> education and all studies and so I stayed in Kirkland and lived in my grandma's attic. And there, um, I, I remember a couple of things about that. Um, one is I started going to a lot of punk rock shows in Seattle, taking the bus and having to take the bus back by midnight, often missing the um, first band. And it brought me a lot of, you know, a lot of responsibility really young and in ways of taking care of myself. So um, even though I was with, you know, adults, I really was pretty straight edge and pretty responsible about myself because I had to catch that bus back to my grandma's attic. Um, and also during that time too, I started to kind of get jobs that were creative already. I One of the jobs I had was in my grandma's attic, I cut all these little pieces of paper and I had to stamp mustard, 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 ketchup, 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 they were like, I was doing the labels for the whole food system for the, um, for the school district. So that was kind of entrepreneurship of mine to make some money. And then um, I went to Evergreen and life really just totally expanded and exploded. Um, there was music, there was thought, there was paths to wander in forests and I started learning the names of everything around me. Like I hadn't, my mother came from Michigan and um, you know, that sense of place, like I had it by just being a kid who wanted to be outside most of the time, but I didn't have the names. I didn't have ways to kind of, um, to even be aware of it. Um, I think once you, sometimes I'm a little reticent to give things names, but when you give something a name, it becomes your neighbor. And I started to, to expand my sense of place so much more at Evergreen. Um, so with the natural world, the connection, but the music. Um, yeah, once the music started really pulling me in, it was this really visceral thing because I didn't do drugs. I still do barely, barely, barely ever drink coffee. Um, I Music to me, I could lose myself with abandon with dancing. I was almost like, um, you know, like a Sufi mystic with my dancing. I would just dance for hours and hours and hours. Pat can attest to that. And I, I think through that music, um, I found a, another level of place to be, not just like the forest, but it was, I don't know, something, something was happening there. So with it was also a way to communicate. You know, we didn't have, you know, I was just, you know, thinking like we just had phones with busy signals or, you know, you like would go and like slip a note under someone's door or something if you wanted to talk to them. But the way that I found a way to communicate with my community was through song. 
so I would write a song and then run down to the alley to the next show that was happening that night and then ask if I could play my song and they said sure so I would sing my song and um, so it was this real like way of immediate expression that was really um, interesting and it was just so vibrant and like it was you know everybody was was had a voice and was using it um, at that time. And then Nikki, though, I, if you could just talk a little bit about Olympia at that time and that there really was this like blossoming of talent because, I mean, you've told me um, there was one TV channel that you could watch maybe. And there, if you wanted to play, you know, if you wanted to have music, you needed to create a place to, to play it and you needed to make a concert that, you know, there wasn't like tons of theater groups and music groups coming through. Yeah, yeah, we just had one TV show. Um, well, one TV show even, <laughs> like all we watched were The Simpsons because that was from someone who came from Evergreen. Um, and yeah, there wasn't TV. We all lived very, 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 very low income lifestyles. Most, a lot of people lived in communal um, apartment buildings where we all had our separate apartments but it was like a shared hall and you kind of knew everybody um it was kind of like one big long pajama party every night um i would even go to my friend's door early in the morning because i woke up before him and i would read his newspaper outside his door and then i would put it back in um so every morning calvin johnson got a pre-read newspaper <laughs> and then um you know it just was it just was like this sense of anything was really possible because you had or anything you wanted you had to make um even jobs you know um you you basically there weren't that many jobs so you kind of had to sort of craft your own your own idea of what that would be and, and yeah you had told me that um you ultimately, I guess after college, I think it was after college, you toured with bands and and you called yourself a craft survivalist. And the way that you would sort of make money was by doing stuff with your hands, like embroidering lyrics on aprons and making mittens and things like that. Um, can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, the craft survivalist, you know, you only have $100 in your pocket and how are you going to spend it? Are you just going to spend it? Or are you going to like invest it into something that then will make $200 in your pocket? So, you know, I would take that $100 and go and find some old vintage aprons and some, you know, the, the bag of glorious embroidery thread that you get at an estate sale. And then I would go and embroider these aprons. And part of it too was, this idea of everybody has a t-shirt, like every band has a t-shirt. Every band actually can play music well because <laughs> I didn't play music very well, but only I had um, aprons to, for my tour or um, mittens too, I just did, I couldn't knit. I it's still just basically knit a square. Um, I, I saw a bunch of people on this chat say that they knit, they knit, they knit, and you, man, you guys are mathematical geniuses. I can just do a square. And so I just did polar fleece um, mittens I sewed and then did, um, you know, some kind of applique on the, on the front. And then I took those mittens and we, our tour took us around the whole country, but we first went down to Los Angeles. And in Los Angeles, those people know how to shop because they bought every pair of mittens I had, except for I had to save one. I was like, what about the kids in Fargo, North Dakota? So I saved one and then did a mail order, like people could sign up. So I had a sample and then they could sign up and I would mail them mittens when, when I got home. Cool. So ultimately um, you left, decided to leave the music scene and you said to concentrate on your art. And one of, the so, only things you did was a calendar or you did, I guess you self published a book and you then self published a calendar. And I, and you talked to me about liking the idea of making your own economy, which is, you know, what you were doing. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, how, what the circumstances were for that first calendar? 
Well, yeah, though, I want to make a point, though. It wasn't so much I gave, like, want to give up music to move into art is I found that art making was a safer place to express myself than being on a stage in a, with a bunch of drunk people with beer bottles. So I could still do my private songs, but do them visually. So the calendar kind of became that. And I think of it even as, I kind of think of it more like as making an album every year. And so there's an album and then each each picture is a song. Um, and the first calendar came about, um, I well, finding art as a safe place to work in, um, I really, really, really wanted to make a book. Um, and I, my whole life I'd wanted to make a book, even as a kid. And so one day, you know, it was just like, it was that moment and um, I sat down, I was like, I'm gonna make a book, it's gonna be today. And I sat down and I made and made this picture here of this apple. And it was just of an apple that I had found on a walk that I had just taken. And I just started to make a book based on that experience. And I did it by cutting paper. And then I had this, there was this art event in our town called Art Walk. And I could get like a friend's store at the bottom, like the, where you walk down the stairs in my apartment building, there was a nature store. And I said, can I just show my art on your wall? And so I did. And um, people responded so positively to it that I, um, and one of the people was this woman who books the place in the coffee shop for art. And so I met with her and she's like, okay, we'll sign you up for January. And I'm like, oh, this was in October. I made the book and January was coming. I still hadn't figured out anything to do. And my friend Stella Mars, um, she said, why don't you make a calendar? And so I made the calendar to solve the problem of what to do for an art show. <laughs> and once I, um, showed the pictures up at the coffee shop, um, I, um, people started freaking out about them and it was in January and I started like printing batches of a hundred of the calendar just at the coffee shop. And I sold 300 of them. And then the next year I didn't do anything. Um, and then everybody would, kept asking me, where's your calendar? You know, it's 1999 now, we need a calendar. <laughs> like, but you, we had one last year. Um, and then, so I was like, okay, year 2000, I'm gonna make a calendar. And I made one. And then also that's the calendar that Via Olympia starts selling. So not only could I sell to the people that actually came to the coffee shop, but now I could sell to somebody who was the first um, person who bought it was someone in New York or something? Am I right? Maybe besides your mom or uh, my business no, no, partner's the mom? The first person who bought online the calendar was somebody away. And this idea that there could be like, you could make something and then it could go away was also a um, really big deal. And then the idea of a calendar too is that it sits on your wall of these places away and more people start to see it and have conversations. Um, so, you know, originally it was just a way to find a safe place to express myself and not be in a bar. <laughs> and instead I found the place I really, really wanted to be was in everybody's kitchen. So um, let's continue to talk about calendars, but let's fast forward to 2021, which is the calendar that, um, has just released and is available. Um, and if you could tell us um, a little bit about the cover and the theme and then and then sort of backtrack just a little and explain over how you make the art and how you use just a simple piece of paper and a blade and create all the images that way. Okay, I'm realizing I left, I am in my kitchen right now. This is kind of where I eat my breakfast and drink my tea just so you can kind of get a place. And it's a foggy morning. Um, so my blade is downstairs. I work down below the kitchen. Um, and I'm just thinking of it, of it down there, like I feel like it's lonely. I should have brought it with me up here. Just, <laughs> like, Cause it's such a extension of myself now that I feel like, you know, like it's a collaborator in this event. Um, 
of this making. So this is the calendar for this year. And um, yeah, I just had this vision of, I'm gonna call it a vision instead of a dream because visions have different meanings. Dreams are fantasies and visions are um, projections forward of ideas. So I had this vision of interacting with an octopus um, and sitting down at a dock and the octopus coming up and us being curious about each other and that there's this idea of, I was looking at thinking of liminal spaces of air and water and that surface in between and how um, when we have this idea of other and the other is often something that you don't know and there's this kind of fear of other but also curiosity of other and how you can interact and like a Venn diagram and have this space in between where you're still, the octopus is still octopus and I'm still me, but there's a space in between where we become something else. And that space is where we build community. And that the more we can expand ourselves into these other spaces, we can build into these communities. And that just sort of was this vision that I had. Um, so I drew some sketches this is my sketchbook um, of what that would look like to me. I did some, I take pictures of myself in weird postures and then I draw a bigger picture. And then that gets transferred onto black paper and then I cut it out with a knife. So everything is still connected. It's all one piece. Um, I find it's, I, I kind of started my artistic exploration with lino cuts and scratch board. And the thing that you make is just so gouged and scratched and it's kind of not very pretty. <laughs> um, but I really, I can find those same kind of contrasts um, with paper. And it actually, it, it is in a way much quicker. It's like, you know, I don't have to ink in or carve away all this spot. Like I can immediately just remove that and then see it. And that's mostly the feeling that I'm going for is this, I just wanna see what's in my mind right that second. And so it's, um, you know, once I make something, it's almost like I, it's just like I'm done with it. I just want to make something else now because it's that moment where you're lost in the making and you're just seeing the thing that's in your mind actually manifest. Um, it's so satisfying to me. Yeah, that's that's the cover of the calendar. Do you want to see the inside now? Too, or? Yeah, yeah, that would be great. And if you could just, uh, I just wanted to clarify for people that so you create the image and then you scan it and then you send it to Pat, correct? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, eventually Pat gets it, yeah. We gotta, we gotta right. put it- Because the difference between that. Uh, yeah, there's Pat's, um, I don't, Pat just hijacked our screen. <laughs> I was just sharing, this is what it looks like once it's in Illustrator before it's colored. And so we used to, this started with Nikki and I sitting right next to each other in front of the scanner, scanning those, pieces of art and learning techniques. And eventually Nikki learned how to use the scanner. Um, so she scans them directly <laughs> now. And uh, I used to trace them and convert them all to Illustrator in that process. And now we have somebody else who helps us with that, Scott. Um, and so I get them in the end and I get to help and sit with Nikki to colorize them and things like that. Yeah, you're, you're the final like filter of it all too. And then, um, Oh gosh, Pat, you're making me long for these moments. <laughs> and we look at things even like, you know, it's pixel by pixel sometimes. Um, yeah. So I know I wanted to hear about, you were wanting to talk about January and I think I wanted to hear about September. So if you could just show us those and tell us a little bit about your thinking. I know you, you said you spend, a, you have it all timed out and you spend a week on each picture. Is that how you schedule yeah. it? Usually, um, you know, it just feels very like if I let things move over a weekend, um, 
my hand changes or the paper has changed and I'm not putting the same value on lines. And I also just want to see what it looks like. Is this going to work? And so I kind of give myself a week to just sort of immerse myself. And when I'm doing the calendar, I'm not doing any other projects. I'm just sort of doing it. And, and then I have these 12 boxes. I make a little list um, of the boxes. And I start filling them in and filling them in until they're all done. And, um, and then also if you could explain how the words come about with it. Um, Oh, Nikki, can uh, you real quick the answer the question a lot of folks are asking is just what yeah. what paper you use? Oh, um, I use Strathmore charcoal paper 500 series, but you can use anything. That's just what I use. Um, I use it because it's acid free. I like the little bit of laid. It has a laid texture to it. Um, I like that solid black. A lot of silhouette cutters use something paper that's printed black on one side and white on the other and they draw on the white side and then flip it. But when you flip an image, everything changes. And then you also, there's, to me, I love that it's the solid thing. Like there's not a little bit of white on the edge. It's just solid. But I was part of an international group of paper cutters in France, um, this exhibition, which I did not go to because I had a little baby. And, but I saw pictures of it and I really wish I had taking the time to do it because there was a room full of people from around the world, all expert paper cutters, all doing it completely different. <laughs> but the idea was still there, like a piece of paper and something sharp. And, you know, one guy had like sweatbands on, like, you know, and like people were using all different kinds of paper, different scales, some people cutting really big, some people with jewelers lenses and cutting small things. Um, it was really fantastic, but the same problem. I have a sheet of paper. How do I cut it away to make a picture? So this is January. Um, I figured January either need to be really hopeful or really um, just really hopeful. <laughs> um, so this is just it. And you can either be in despair and have hope or be um, just, we just need to keep moving forward. And there's Pat showing it better. And then she also really wanted to see Liberate. Oh, right. I forgot. Yeah. So, Pat, are you going to show Liberate? Or are you going to just. <laughs> I feel like we're working too. Like when he does that, I, this is like, a lot what it's like. Nikki tries to point at the screen and move things a lot. <laughs> Which like, month is liberate? I'm sorry. Like Pavlov's dog. Like I'm like, oh God, okay. Now we, then we got to, oh, we mix, we missed that. Book. Oh, the book, the book one. This is a funny part of this process um, is I don't often know the names until the very end. So I often have creative names for <laughs> each one. And so this one is just Lois in the library in, I think, Tacoma, is what I yeah. called so this. This is my friend Lois, who you listen to the music if you were in the waiting room. She sang um, songs. And this is her in uh, Tacoma Book World or Tacoma Book Center. What's it called? This, this is bookstore, used bookstore of every single book ever written, it feels like. And you kind of wonder, like, am I going to, by making books, I'm just you know, like I'm part of this process of making books, but there's, you just think of all those stories in there and there's just so many stories. And how well, sometimes there's tricks that we have to do for the actual calendar to make things like the dates fit. And if you see where the dates and the words are, so there's actually in the original books back there, but they didn't fit. So we needed to cover them up. And so there's little tricks like that and differences that you'll see in the calendar versus her original art. Yeah. So the calendar to me is the is a different version. It's the graphic interpretation of my original artwork, which is a it's a 3D object that is made, whereas this is more like a graphic type of the key difference, I think the key difference that you see that you don't see as a people who've looked at your work forever is the shadows that happen is when you hold up that you can hold up that paper and 
the, the cut and put it against white. There's subtle shadows in each cut and the paper curves and waves. And you really only get to see that in the originals. Um, we actually have, or had until the pandemic, an art gallery down in Portland where Nikki would show this work every year yeah, in November. Awesome. And people are always blown away when they see it actually in person, even though they've seen the calendars for 20 years, because there's something in the subtlety of the way the paper moves and the naturalness that you don't- the, don't the, the hand. I think it's that what you see in person is, mm -hmm the sort of humanity of it, you know, like you taken away from all the computer part and you, you feel Nikki's presence and her poetry in it. Yeah, though when I see, um, like, you know, for me, it was just initially, it was just, I had to replicate my work. And so it was just, you know, put it down on the copy machine and copy it. And the paper cuts were really great and easy for that. Like it wasn't gonna get, fine lines weren't gonna get lost. It was like, but and then technology, you know, it was kind of this in-between point of like digital and cameras. And like my first book, I actually did photostat photos of rather than copies of to preserve the art. And now, you know, you would take a, you would scan it, but it, it seems like there was this kind of shift in technology that only now I think can a printer actually print my work as you would see it for real in real life. Mm -hmm. um, but when I see printed work of paper cuts, I kind of always am a little like the shadows kind of get in the way of the image in some ways. So to me, it's a way to get to an image and get to a message and the most direct way. And then the art, the, the, the paper cuts, are the art part of it. And that is, I think, a different, that's more the intimate in someone's home and a relationship with a family over long periods of time. And this brings me to sort of another theme um, which, that really runs through everything that you do, which is community. And it seems like the community in Olympia when you got there and went to Evergreen and the music scene was really, kind of integral to your development and then through your art, um, you both express your ideas about community, but you also grow your community. And, you know, talking about having your art and certainly your calendars um, around the world and calendars being in everyone's kitchen, you know, probably the room aside from our bedrooms where we spend the most time. And then community in your lifestyle um, you know, when I visited you, when I was researching my book, Making a Life, you were talking all about the different things that you did within your community, that your artwork sometimes was up at the barber shop, that you traded um, artwork to a, a farm uh, and you got produce in exchange for the artwork. And one of the highlights for me of that visit, which was I got to stay like overnight in Nikki's house, which was amazing and go for walks with you and JT, your husband and Rin, the photographer went sailing with your husband and your son. And it was really so special. But one of the real highlights was when you read to me the manuscripts for your book, What Will These Hands Make? And at that time you might've had little thumbnail sketches done. I don't remember, but you read me the story and I would like, for you to read it to all of us now so everyone here can experience what I experienced um, at that time. Here, let me find it. <clears throat> so this is, what will these hands make? This came out in late February <laughs> and I was on a book tour and um, it was really fun to read it to a bunch of kids, but you know, um, everything was kind of shutting down as I left in my wake. So um, hopefully everybody's safe and we can get back to this idea of this community. Um, what will these hands make? So we have a toolbox and a bunch of hands. This is for Finn and JT, it's my son and partner. And he, she has one of those like how-to books. So you, this one is you take your hands, these are the tools, scissors, needle, thread, 
and you cut out this shape and she's cutting it out of an old sweater. What will these hands make? Will these hands make a teacup for a child, a bowl round and shiny, a quilt to warm and a chair for listening? Will these hands make a hat for a baby's head, a wall to walk along, a gate to open, a garden for many? Will these hands make a bicycle to ride, a sidewalk safe, a haven for others, and a bench to rest a while? She's um, saving all the woolly bear caterpillars, which is something I do this time of year. Um, they crawl across the road my little kind of quiet little drive that I live down and sometimes I get squished by other people but I stop my car and I get out and I pick up the woolly bear caterpillar and put it on my lap and drive on and it starts to crawl along and then there's another one I stop the car and I get the woolly bear caterpillar and I put it on my like shoulder and it's crawling along and then there's another one you know so by the time I get home there's you know like sometimes if I'm lucky I've saved like five caterpillars from being squashed. Um, but sometimes I just find squashed ones. And then I feel like, oh, if only I'd gone 15 minutes earlier, I could have saved some. So that's a haven for others. And here's the town that they occupy, that they live in, it's their community. They're up here on this bench. And this is my house. This is me down here working in my studio. This is my husband JT's shop, which he is a woodworker and builds furniture, but um, I have turned it into his dream shop, which is a boat shop, which actually is becoming more and more. This is our boat house. We, he built this little house down on the beach. And Olympia doesn't really look like this, but um, there's parts of all my favorite places. Um, in town and in other towns. Will these hands make a bridge to cross the river, a boat to sail the sea, a house for swallows or a home for families? Here they are into the town. Remember when life was like that? <laughs> Serendipitous meetings of people and Will these hands make a sign to point the way, a bouquet to celebrate, a gift to give, and a basket for everything? I want to be a basket maker. Will these hands make a raven from a tree, a cabinet for treasure, a painting bright, and a flag to wave hello? I like making flags. This is... Um, Marilyn Frasca, who teaches art at Evergreen State College. I never got to take an art class by her, but um, she's amazing. She taught Linda Berry. This is JT Scott, my husband, and he's building one of his cabinets. Will these hands make a knife to cut carrots, a cake six layers high, a spoon to stir, and a song for a parade? Remember things like this, when we could have a parade and the, there were no cars <laughs> and you only could transport your six layer cakes by wheelbarrow um, and everybody would come to your little tiny house. It's almost like a giant punk party and everybody would cram into a little tiny house and have a party. This is my friend Lois who was singing those songs and also looking for books. Will these hands make a pillow for grandma, a pair of slippers for her feet, a candle to light, and a bread to pull apart? Will these hands make a box to hold memories, a bear to sit beside, a book to share, and a blanket woven tight? The blankets appear. And off they go. Will these hands make a fiddle to play quick, a stack of wood for the night, a play to cheer, and a lantern to guide the way back home. This is Mike Kanka. He printed all of my t-shirts that I've ever made. Will these hands make a safe place to be?
Will these hands make a community? What will your hands make? You could trace your hand here. You could trace your other hand there. Uh, I I love that book so much. And you, when you introduced it, you said something about it being a children's book. And when you read the manuscript to me, when I visited, and when I got the book, and when I you know ever I look at it, I think this is a book that really transcends age. I think it's for everyone. And, and it, it speaks to, to my heart. And I feel like my book, Making a Life, which is clearly an adult book, but I feel like there's such a great pair because you in, I don't know how many pages that was or how many images made the same point that I took 320 pages to make, mm -hmm. which is that our hands are one of, are what are a really big part of what make us human, our ability to use our hands to make tools and then to make what we need to survive is, is what being human is about. It's about, it's to me, it seems like the closer we are to being sort of competent and able to make a life for ourselves with our hands, the more fulfilled and satisfied we feel. And I feel like we've, as a society, we're drawn away from that a lot. And mm -hmm. as a human being, a mother, a sister, wife, a friend, all the things I mentioned in the beginning, it feels like you do such a eloquent job of bringing us home to ourselves um, and living really authentically. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, that authenticity that seems to run through you and that I'm sure you've noticed a lot of us have trouble with that. There are a lot of people who talk about not living the life that they wanna live, that wishing that certain things could be different or you know, waiting for another day when they'll have more time to do paper cutting or knit or take more walks or whatever it might be, but um, I'm hoping you can just sort of share more of your experience and, and what keeps you so grounded. Well, I waste time too. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, fritter away time. And, um, and, and it is, honestly, it is harder and harder to, to find that focus and to, to be free, um, free from, this world that we are embroiled and want to check in on all the every 15 minutes um you know to me it's just a matter of like what i don't know how can you talk about being authentic without not being yeah authentic? without not being authentic well maybe here's something here nikki yeah can you talk a little bit about how you feel when you have that exacto blade in your hand because I feel like that really gets to how a lot of us feel when we're using our hands to make something or we're expressing our true selves. I mean, just even when you talk about it, my finger starts to feel warm. You know, like there's this little buzzing in my finger that is like, oh yeah. Like I, it's not just, it's, it's a physical thing. It's a, it's, a, it's a memory of in my cells. It's, it's how my body, you know, these are tool not just tool making, but they're tools and how we use them. And that um, ignites our brain. And, um, you know, when I was, you know, so, so to me, like I think of my whole self as I'm a, an animal, I'm a body, I am, um, I am cells, I am circulation system. And to, to do my work, I often have to, activate all those things. So why I was actually, why we were getting ready for this conversation, say, um, I am here at my kitchen table nook area and there's kind of this bench I'm sitting on and I can't move out of this space because there's just crazy stuff all around. Um, 
because of the setup for this, but the music was playing. So I just stood up on this bench and just danced a little. <laughs> so I was having a little dance party. And that like igniting my whole body um, felt really good to before I just sat in front uh, and had this computer conversation. I had to have something real happen to my day that was actually of my body. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that might be part of it. But, you know, so when you think about making things by hand, that that often there's repetition you know when i'm making a picture let me show you this one picture because i brought it up it's not so much the picture it's the repetition of the making so cutting out all these little raindrops just felt like what i needed to do at that moment and um it just felt really good. Um, yeah. So it's it's that physical part that I think, and that, that I don't get, like when Pat said that I got really good at scanning, <laughs> um, that I... Oh, are we losing Nikki? I can't tell if, can are we connected? Can anybody else talk? <laughs> way like making by hand does so okay I think I got disconnected for a second so I might have missed something there but I in I just wanted to um to say one other thing about sort of this idea of authenticity um you gave me a piece of advice um one in one of our conversations um when I was writing about you and um you said make sure you touch the earth every day and I know that you um, go for, as long as there's not too much smoke in the air as there has been recently, but you go for a walk every morning with uh, JT, either on the beach or in the woods, depending on the tide. I know you sail a lot and you swim a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't do as much outside as you do, but I have to say- Oh, she got cut off. But I think what she wanted to say, we, you got cut off again. Are you there? Okay. So, um, yeah, touching the earth. And I just think, you know, we have to remember that we're on a planet, <laughs> you know, and there's universe and we're just these little tiny things. And there's not really that much earth on earth. Um, it's mostly water. So in some ways I've actually tried to have the mantra during this pandemic is to swim every day. Um, or swim every high tide that I can. So to actually immerse myself in the water has been really, um, it, it feels, there's, there's less people in the water, <laughs> especially down here in Puget Sound. Like you don't really run into other people in the water, so it's pretty safe activity. Um, so I've been swimming a lot. But yeah, touching, you know, like dirt, not, Concrete doesn't count. It's like, you know, soil, dirt, and all the millions of things that are within each little cubic centimeter of those, of that. Nice. Yeah, uh, you know, this is, it's not just like this idea of being grounded. It's actually just, it's, I think it's like just necessary for your, your biological being. Yeah. So I want to move along to the Q and A. Okay. Um, Pat, I hope has collected some questions. Um, we'll only have time. There haven't been as many. We've we've answered a lot of them. Um, someone wanted to know how much time, Nikki, do you spend in the studio? Whether you're inspired or is it a schedule? If you could talk a little bit about process, I think people would like to hear that a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How do you make this work? This idea of working. On your own. So I um, I work in the morning. My son goes to school, or he goes off now into. He built a little house, so he goes off there, and I sit down and I start to work. And I try to do the creative part of my work in the morning, and then do the more mundane um, computer parts in the afternoon. Um, so I have taken a walk because I work in my house. I everybody had breakfast, everybody's settled. I go on this walk, which 
can be one to two miles and then I come back and sit down and then I start work. And I often um, leave my work right when I'm most excited about it because then I can come back and be excited. I take lunch break. I have a very generous um, employee uh, employer um, who lets me have a really long extended lunch break with my family, <laughs> and then, um, which is me. And then I sometimes take a walk after lunch where JT and I kind of process things that came in or like, oh, like I don't really want to answer this email. Like, uh, and then he'll kind of counsel me on, or, or if I know if I don't want to tell him about this idea, then I probably shouldn't be doing it because it will be, you know, kind of putting a lot of strain on my family's time. Um, and then I, in the afternoon, I work to probably around three and then the light changes and I just have to go outside and just do other work. It's like, to me, there's like the desk work and the working on images, but then there's the work of life, which takes you out into the garden and you start seeing like, oh, look at those cabbage butterflies dancing together. Look at these spider webs. So oh, what did the spider catch today? Maybe I should feed her something or, you know, like where are the flowers at? And you just start doing that other kind of work, which is, just life. And then you say, oh, look, it's high tide. I'm going to go swimming. That's how, that's basically my day. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's basically right now, though, it really does feel like we're all just living meal to meal, you know, like, <laughs> it's like, okay, now I'm going to think about lunch. Now I'm going to think about dinner. Um, yeah. Talk us through the, the piece, the one with all the raindrops. When you oh. did that, did you do it all in one sitting or did you because people are talking about that in the chat a lot and just I know, isn't this that start, what happened, yeah. <laughs> so this is for my next book. It's called One, Two, Three, Salish Sea. And how do you show a million? Here's the book. I got an advanced reader copy. It's gonna be published in Canada with Orca Books and in the US with Sasquatch Books. So that page is a million raindrops. And I really wanted to do it so it was 1,000 so that you would then know that within each of these raindrops was, if you could imagine this picture within each of those raindrops, you would get to a million. Um, but I overdid it and there's like um, uh, 2,187 raindrops on this page. <laughs> so I kind of got too into it. Um, so then my math expansion was thrown off. So that takes time, yeah. That probably, I would probably do like this amount in a day. And just, it's kind of like, you know, it's meditation, but then there's also gazing out the window and, and that type of thing. It's really interesting. I'm always talking to people about this idea of time because when you make things by hand, um, like I'm wearing a dress I sewed by hand and a sweater I knit by hand. And people, the, one of the first questions they always ask is how long did it take? Yeah. And um, I always say it took a really long time. Like that's the good part. You know, yeah. that's what I love, the process. And, right. and when I see all those raindrops, you know, I think of, you know, my sweater, which probably has 2000 stitches or more. <laughs> yeah, it took, yeah. No, I, it took, it, it takes, sometimes it doesn't take enough time. You know, it didn't take long enough because you want that feeling like it's, you know, it's this, it's really a pleasant feeling when you get lost in making. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a, a moving meditation. Um, and it's such an important, part of our lives both you know just being engaged in that way and something rhythmic and meditative that allows our minds to wander mm -hmm. but also even times when we're not being quote unquote productive we're not doing something but just wandering in either sitting in our home or wandering out by the beach or you know wherever it might be and I'm always amazed and it's, I, I'm interested if you have this experience that sometimes like I, I feel like, no, 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 I got to get to my to-do list. 
And I, and then there's this part of me that knows that taking a break is the answer. Like in order to ultimately be productive, stopping is what I need to do. I need to have faith in whatever goes on deep inside of us mm -hmm. that figures things out. How do you feel about that? Oh yeah, I'm totally all for playing hooky. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I tried to even tell my son that too with school, like, you know, like instead of fretting about, let's just go take a walk. And, you know, I find that walking, it's that repetition, it's of motion and movement. And then you're just aware, you know, really everybody should just, you know, it's really my prescriptive for everything. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, that, you know, I just think of um, quilters too, just how long it takes. I made one quilt. And it took me, oh, it took me a long time. <laughs> I hand stitched the whole thing. I hand printed the material. I, I did it as queen size. I, you know, didn't do it. Like I made all these pieces and then I applied them on. And then I, it just was layers and layers of stitches and stitches and stitches and stitches. But it was so comforting that feeling of, um, working on it uh, I loved it so you know like when you think about making like I'm I'm a like I had become a professional maker like it's how I support myself and support my family but I would still be making even if I were had a regular job um I would I would just there's just this need in me and I believe that if you are probably watching this there's a need in you as well um to be making something and but so you're right making it doesn't have to be sitting on your couch with your quilt the whole time making is also taking that walk and thinking about your quilt or seeing the colors and leaves and thinking about different greens you could use or um things like that or patterns and you just have to also making is more than just the actual sitting down with the thing and doing it it's it's a it's a bigger, bigger well, it's, stuff. yeah and it's as I always like to say it's it's part of what makes us human and it's a pathway to wellness and um I think that you know, sometimes when people, I'm sure, you know, come to conversations like this and we see your work, which is so extraordinary, or people sometimes, you know, might read about you or other makers and then they think those people are other, you know, those are the lucky people who get to do this, or those are the super talented people that, you know, more talented than I am and that they've been able to create this life that I, that others long for. But what I'm always, really trying to promote, and I think you are as well, is that whether you sell your work or whether you can spend, you know, eight hours or four hours or five minutes a day sort of making things, that it's, it's all so good for us. And that really like the word artist, I feel has done a lot of harm to certain people because they don't think that if they don't qualify as artist in their own mind, that somehow the making doesn't have value. Right. I just watched this amazing documentary about George Nakashima last night. Mm -hmm. He did not ever want to be called an architect or uh, um, an artist. He just always called himself a woodworker. And, um, you know, he was a brilliant genius. And, but he was a woodworker and he just worked with wood. You know, that, that, and that he thought art, people calling themselves artists actually, yeah, was a bet betrayal of the making of it, like, or that the craft wasn't, the skill wasn't also elevated. And, you know, and back to that, like, the idea of skill, like, I consider myself a hack still, like, you know, I'm not, like, like each picture, there's a mistake in it that leads me to try to do better for the next one. So I'm Someone still- in the chat asked about mistakes. Can you talk about how, I mean, you still work around them? Like rarely do you scrap things. And do you want to talk about like, if you do a miscut, what your process is? Well, this picture of the calendar cover is not the cover that I use. So um, 
covers are kind of different. Now it's all just getting messed up. <laughs> I don't care about it. <laughs> um, so sometimes I will just redo it, but it still is valid. Like it's still to me, like even if I've made something that I don't particularly like for some, maybe some technical reason, it's, I'm actually like, you know, sometimes people, people still find their story and meaning in it. And so it does, it isn't up to me to really even define what a mistake is or what makes something not good. Um, it just is, and it's been made into the world and it's up to other viewers to kind of, I'm not the type of person who's the, um, the potter who smashes any imperfected, you know, like just their work that they don't like. They don't want any record of it for history. Like, you know, you're gonna find a file cabinet full of scraps <laughs> and make the best of it when, after when they pass away. <laughs> Yeah. One so, thing people want to know when you talk about meaning in, in words is people often want to know how you choose okay. the words for each calendar and what that process is. And as someone who's seen you change your mind a couple times last minute, do you want to? Yeah. Even just like as we're like about to send it to press, I'm like, ah, this word, this word. Um, I'm trying to find a good example within this. So, so this is like a note from my, you know, it's got rebuild, comfort, share, revive, insurrect, assist, unearth, spring forth, shine. Yeah, alchemy, transform, rise, give everything, one for all, expand. I didn't what use that. Anything. turn into? Is that? I, well, you're gonna have to get the calendar to find out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, you know it just it, 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 there's like this running list and so there's that list which is my sketch but then when I'm doing the final art while I'm actually cutting I'm also thinking of the words and then I've been having fun on Instagram where I just sort of put it out there and they get this like avalanche of words that you know and I, I just and I go and I write them all down on a piece of pieces of paper and so I just am kind of surrounded by this cloud of words submitted from, from everybody out there. What, what's like the, the zeitgeist, like what are the words that people are thinking of? Um, and then know too that I'm working, like I'm working on this work now or a, in a now <laughs> for a future. And so I am thinking, what are people feeling in this now, but I also need to know what are they going to be thinking of and feeling in the future. So I'm kind of, I kind of work in the future. It's almost like I'm a time traveler and I um, am thinking, what are we going to need then? Um, so we're at one minute after the hour. So for anybody who said I signed up for an hour and now it's an hour, I want you to feel comfortable if you would like to leave. We, I have two sort of kind of official pieces of business to mention. And then we're, um, Pat and Nikki agreed to stay on for a few more minutes, probably until quarter after. Um, and then we have a short slideshow to end this. Um, but, um, it's up to you, optional. If you, it's always optional if you want to go off. But in, in any case, I just wanted to mention um, and that there is a, if you would like this programming to continue, the idea is that these conversations will happen approximately once a month and they will always be free. And um, I just want as big a community as possible to be part of it. But we added um, this month, um, this is the third conversation, a tip jar and it's, somewhere on the events page. Um, and uh, if you ever wanna donate a few dollars to cover some of the costs of doing it, that's great. If you don't, totally fine. Um, and then I will send a follow-up email to everyone who registered. It will include a link to the recording. So you can watch again if you'd like. There'll also be some information about um, a new initiative of mine called Maker Circle, which is a subscription uh, program where people can sign up to get a monthly creative prompt, do a monthly Zoom meeting, a much smaller one than this, where we can talk and interact. Um, 
and all sorts of other creative surprises. So um, that's my business part. And now getting back to, to Nikki and Pat, um, can you, do we have more questions? Do you remember your first paper cut, Nikki? That's always a, a good one, just to talk about what got you into cutting paper versus drawing. Um, Cause you draw too. I mean, we've done projects together where it hasn't been paper cut. And so what started you down the, the road of where you are now with an X-Acto knife and blistered fingers? Part of it was that I started seeing my work being replicated around town with like third generation copies of things that I had drawn or made and it looked crappy. <laughs> so in some ways it was like if people were going to copy my art, I wanted it to actually be clear. And so, and so I started thinking like, how can I have it be just really high contrast but I didn't have this language. Like I didn't take art, I took science. So I didn't really even know what I was like wanting. And my friend Taewon Yu, um, he said, why don't you cut out a paper? So I sat down and I cut this out of paper. And it was the thing that started it all. And it's just an apple falling from a tree. I mean, it's really like it's Newton. It's the law of gravity here. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, I never thought of it that way. Um, so this apple fell, but like, how do I like, I'm also a very untidy person. So like if this apple was just there, how do you even know it's falling if it didn't have these lines? But then it looks like it's on a swing. And then, so I had to bring in wind, like a reason for the apple to be falling, a story for that apple to be falling. And so there's these wind and it's all becomes one piece of, it's all one piece of paper, mostly also just so I wouldn't lose all the little tiny scraps. Um, and then, I mean, it makes it much easier to deal with. <laughs> so this was my first with a knife. I had been cutting sort of folded Valentines for friends for many years as well. So with scissor cutting, um, with giant scissors that we get from Boeing um, airplane companies um, surplus store these big giant heavy scissors I would cut little tiny things or when I would be um, watching kids I would do folded cuts so I would fold accordion cut and then ask the kid and they'd be like I want a gorilla on the Empire State Building and so I would do that and then okay now I want an elephant with a umbrella eating an ice cream cone and I would cut that and fold it out just as a way to not have kids cry <laughs> I think I saw in the chat there someone just asked um how are your wrists how do you make sure that you stay healthy <laughs> thanks for asking um well I actually now that I remember that guy with the um, wristbands like I really I, I think I might need to do back to the wristband how do I stay healthy um exercises warm up before I begin do like all these stretches and I, when I would do the book tour with the kids with what will these hands make, we did all these um, stretches together with our hands and just get them to like, if you're like doing this concentrated work, how to use your whole body and to take care of yourself that you're an athlete, a maker is an athlete and you need to stretch. Um, I did carry these really heavy cinder blocks two days ago. So my wrist this morning, I was like, oh, maybe you don't do that. You know, you're an athlete. You, don't. <laughs> you let the <laughs> let other people carry cinder blocks for you. Um, and I also, you know, I take, I take time off. I, um, I don't cut paper every day for 365 days a year. I take the summers off mostly. Um, because teachers get to take time off and it also is sort of like a, a sabbatical within the year where I just go and just become a berry picker or a sailor or a swimmer and not an artist at all. Um, and so I, I rest and then move into, but always when I'm kind of starting again, it is kind of like a little like creek, creek, creek. But um, so when yeah. you take the summer off, um, do your pants get like itchy to to start again? Um, do you do you miss? No, no. I, I mean I'm doing other things. Like I'm I am well. I guess I'm making things. Like I'll make like you know like well we got this old sailboat which will be my next next book is about that, and 
one of the things I'll be like, oh, today is like a special day. Let's make a flag. And so I'll be like making a flag all day. And then, you know, or to me, making dinner is also a creative act. I never quite know what I'm going to make. And um, so I, you know, it's, it's, it's physical. It's making. Yeah. One thing um, I also wanted to, to mention um, that Nikki, you and I talked about recently, we were talking about how things have changed with um, COVID and, and we were also talking about what projects you had coming up. And, and you said that you um, started selling some of your original artwork on, via Instagram. Is that, am I remembering correctly? Yeah. So Land Gallery, which is part of Pat Runs with um, by Olympia, um, had to close because it's a very small space and only and, like 600 square feet for the whole thing it's a tiny yeah and we should that's in portland right that's in portland oregon yeah in, in the mississippi neighborhood and we're currently yeah. closed okay yeah so what to do when you have a you know art show that you kind of have a standing uh res reserved space for november when and and this work that i made that i want to share so i've been every every so often, it's not really like, you know, every Tuesday I drop it or anything like that, but every so often I put up a new picture and I'm just doing the calendar in sequence and then people um, can direct message me if they would like to um, purchase one. And it's been really strangely successful. Like, I mean, it was like when, when Pat, you first started by Olympia, I was like, that's not going to work. People aren't going to buy things on the on a computer on the internet like people have to touch things like it really was like you have to touch it to know if you want it and like and so like an expensive piece of art that is like an heirloom piece of art like when you want to see it but apparently we're well and that's what we always tried to do on the website was take as many photos of the art as possible get it from as many angles just give people as much information and so it isn't it is nuts how much the world has changed and how yeah. willing people are to sort of trust this medium that they they used to not or at but least I think it's also like us trusting each other too like right. you know so I you know it's, it's been really it's actually really nice because it's now I like I know where these people are because I have to like write their address on this box and send it to them and I you know I include a note like I write them a letter and then they write me back and it's like you you develop more of a relationship than I think what has been the case for gallery sold work um, prior um, that has made us more open to, to you know, the, you just, everybody's just so starved for connections really. So, you know, it's a way to connect with people. Well, I that. think the traditional structures are to place, you know, you're buying from the gallery when in all truth, it's you're buying from me and you. And so a lot of historical structures in this place have been intentionally vague or, I mean, people always think by Olympia is bigger than it is because maybe they see our ad in Mother Jones and stuff. And it's like, no, we're still just three or four people in a warehouse. We're not big. We just try to act big so that people want to <laughs> trust us and buy from us. Um, but it is an interesting thing. Traditional gallery spaces, traditional like online stores. Uh, I see that a lot in customer service. So we were dramatically affected by the wildfires down here in Portland where we couldn't go outside. So the warehouse shut down for a week and people are like, hey, you know, they're so used to Amazon or other things where they're, you know, I didn't get this. I ordered it yesterday. Where is it? And part of it's like, well, we're literally did not want to get sick to bring out your order. And once people realize a lot of times that there's someone at the other end, um, there's an anonymous aspect of just clicking and so direct from you feels like oh okay I'm actually buying from a, a human on the other end and not a robot and so I think that's it's been an interesting side effect of all all becoming so digital over the past yeah. six months I mean we all can be in each other it's like you're in my kitchen right now you know <laughs> well you know what this sort of sort of comes full circle for me and when we started, I really wanted to talk a bit about, you know, you guys meeting in Olympia with this punk rock movement. And, you know, it was only after getting to know you, Nikki, and just reading more about Olympia and that music scene and realizing that it began with this idea of people being self-sufficient. 
of people making real connections, of people making their own economies. And, you know, we have this society in which this corporate structure plays such a huge role and it really like is pounding away at us. And, you know, the punk rock movement of self-expression and, and sort of making your own rules, making your own economy, and then the DIY movement. And now, you know, for all of us, we're, we, like you just said, Nikki, we want that connection so badly. And when you get a letter, or when you buy a piece of art and the artist, you know, writes you a note or, um, you know, and, and, and just the whole idea of Buy Olympia and how it started all those years ago. So Pat and his partner could sell their friends art. And that's what you're still doing. And that's, that's what we need and want. And, you know, I do want to say, cause we're coming to the end that, um, you know, by Olympia is our partner for this event. And, um, you know, let's support what Pat is doing. And, you know, if you're Christmas shopping or you need a new calendar or any of that, um, you know, I just am so grateful to Pat for having a business like that and for being our partner. And um, so I just want to remind you of that. <laughs> it, would, it, it, it makes what I do possible because I don't have to go find the box, except now when I'm shipping this art, or find the tape, find a way to get out there. Like Pat has made all that possible that I can just make my work and focus on that and live my life. And then he's done all the other parts. So thank you, Pat. And you. Um, yeah, and, and you know, like thinking of the DIY, like do it yourself. Um, we've been talking about it a little bit like it needs to change to DIT do it together mm -hmm. and um, that's what we need so it's not quite as dit doesn't sound <laughs> <laughs> DIY but DIT um, do it together I think one of the things that Olympia taught both of us is that when people are like, well, the city does this or no one's putting on a show, it's like you go out and do it yourself. Uh, one of the things that I always remember about Olympia is we used to not we used to not allow backyard chickens it was prohibited in the code and people are like well the city will never do that and it's like we all went there were like 40 of us who went to the the planning commission meeting got there and we're like hey chickens are important and stuff and that was my first introduction to like local like politics when it's not politics it's just like people want chickens in their backyard and through that we we're able to change it and so whenever people later would be like oh the city will never let that happen it's like all it takes sometimes is 40 people together in a room and change can happen. And that's true, whether it's art or chickens in your backyard. And that's one of the huge lessons, I think, growing up like 17 to 30 in Olympia taught me was that if you want to affect change, you, you have to show up. And that's like all the, the punk rock and music people that we knew who created labels and did that kind of stuff, they were showing up every day. And it's so much of it is just being there, being present, making those connections, and you really can affect real change. And so that's one of the beauties of Olympia. And I think that carries through to your work. And definitely what we've done with By Olympia is just try to show up every day for 21 yeah. years. And it's always been like, you know, that do it yourself, but it really has always been do it together. It has been, it was always was a very collaborative or not just well not necessarily collaborative but celebratory like it wasn't like a um, competitive um environment like we just each really just helped each other a lot right. if your friend's putting on a show and even if they're not that good <laughs> like if their music <laughs> isn't great if their art's like eh, you show up because they're your friends and they're your community and that's basically i mean like olympia was encouraging in that way there is competition, but it's not like I have to be the best. It's more of an inspiration, like, oh, Nikki's doing that. I should do that. Oh, Pat started a business. I could start a business. Like, oh, that zine is rad. I wait, I can make a zine? Yes, you can. And so it's like there was that like gentle nudging of each other that I think helped propel the both indie rock and uh craft movement in the early 90s and to this day. Yeah, I think that um showing up and, and trying, you know, we all showed up today. I mean, I started these conversations in, in June with a lot of fear and it was like, okay, well just announce it. And then <laughs> people are gonna have an expectation 
and then you do it. Um, and I feel like, you know, this, the idea that we can affect change, we need to show up um, segues beautifully to the fact that we have an election coming up. So please everybody vote. Um, I wanna end this. It's always hard to end on uh, Zoom because it feels abrupt. So I've been working on different ideas for this, but um, I'm gonna read a quote um, from Lois. Is it, does it pronounce Mafio? Mafeo. Mafeo. And the music you heard if you came um, and in the beginning, if you were a few minutes earlier, was Lois's music and Nikki's very, very good friend, someone who's been in, depicted in her books. And um, this is a, something she wrote about Nikki and a piece of her work. And then following that, Pat is going to run a short slideshow with some of Lois's work where you'll I mean, with Lois's music, and you will see the piece that um, she, Nick, that Lois refers to in this quote, and then some spreads from my book that show Nikki and her family in their home space. So you'll get a sense of more of more than the kitchen, and then a few more pieces of Nikki's work, and then the music will gradually soften, and then this will be officially over. So. Um, before I read the quote, I'll just say thank you to all of you for showing up and being part of this community today. And of course to Nikki and Pat, and then behind the scenes um, to Joan and Allie, who have been sort of keeping this whole thing together while we're talking. So here I go, here's the quote about Nikki. There is a paper cut that Nikki made in 2006 of a woman diving into water. Her hands are clasped, and her technique is effortless. This is how I think of Nikki, fearlessly diving in and inviting us to share what it feels like, offering encouragement to those who want to dive in as well. So with that, I would say thank you again and dive in. <laughs>